It was a day of momentous and historic firsts as the world watched Barack Obama sworn in as the 44th President of the United States. The multitude followed every moment of the day on huge monitors. Before facing the massive crowds, Obama stopped by the White House. Yes, sir. President Bush called out, sir, as the president-elect climbed out of his limo. The Obamas were greeted warmly on the portico of the White House by President and Mrs. Bush. Michelle Obama had a gift for the First Lady, telling her, this is for your new home. It's a journal inscribed with today's date and a pen. They posed together for pictures, and as they entered the White House, President Bush could be seen giving his successor a friendly slap on the back. By 10 a.m., the National Mall was packed with a sea of humanity estimated at 2 million people seeking to witness history being made. Vice President Cheney left the White House in a wheelchair because he had pulled a muscle packing his belongings. The two first ladies emerged from the White House together, followed by the two presidents who rode side by side in the motorcade to the Capitol for the inauguration. All along the route, the motorcade was greeted with waving flags, cheers and salutes. The TV audience had an unusual glimpse behind the scenes inside the Capitol as former presidents prepared to take their seats. The first President Bush and Barbara Bush wore purple scarves to symbolize national unity, the combination of both red and blue. There were warm greetings behind the scenes between the Bushes and the Clintons. But look at this, an apparent snub as President Carter and his wife Rosalind seemed to ignore the Clintons, walking right by without a greeting. And this was our first glimpse of the Obama children, Sasha and Malia. Malia Obama and Sasha Obama. Ladies and gentlemen, the president-elect of the United States, Barack H. Obama. And this was the rapturous welcome for president-elect Obama as he emerged from the Capitol. Aretha Franklin sang My Country Tis of Thee as the atmosphere of electric anticipation mounted among the crowds. The nation's first Catholic vice president, Joe Biden, took his oath of office. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And then a moment to be etched in history. America's first black president took the solemn oath of office on the Bible held by Michelle that Lincoln used in his inauguration. There was a moment of nerves as the Chief Justice flubbed the words of the oath of office. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear that I will execute the office of president to the United States faithfully. That I will execute the off faithfully the, pres the office of president of the, the United States. The office of president of the United States faithfully. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. <laughs> As hail to the chief and cannon fire echoed across the mall, there was a thumbs up for the new president from daughter Sasha and a hug from her sister Malia. Thank you. In a somber inaugural speech, President Obama challenged America to reunite to meet the tough challenges of the future. Today I say to you that the challenges we face are real. They are serious and they are many. They will not be met easily or in a short span of time. But know this, America, they will be met. And the new president and first lady joined in a moving rendition of the national anthem. There was a triumphal parade back to the White House with the Obamas walking Pennsylvania Avenue, acknowledging the ecstatic support of the crowd. Minutes later, the children joined them and they made their first official appearance as a family on the parade viewing stand. Then it was back to the White House and the hard work of leading the nation began.
A crowd of historic proportions, two million strong, descended on the nation's capital to see Barack Obama sworn in as 44th president, and a sea of famous faces were on hand for the eventful day. There was Obama's number one supporter, Oprah Winfrey, with best friend Gail King and longtime love, Stedman Graham. Beyonce looked beautiful, standing between P. Diddy and husband Jay-Z. Dustin Hoffman was on hand, and director Steven Spielberg was bundled up in the scar. Boxing legend Muhammad Ali was there to witness history, and so was basketball great Magic Johnson. And Aretha Franklin wore quite a hat. That's Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore showing us their tickets. That is uh, the best thing I could possibly buy today. Actor Tim Robbins played with an Obama hand puppet. The country's most famous political power brokers were all present. All four former presidents were on hand. George Bush Sr. was limping and carried a cane. The Bush twins Barbara and Jenna looked lovely. Michelle Obama arrived with Laura Bush. New first daughter, 10-year-old Malia, had her ever-present camera to take pictures of dad's big day. Security was extraordinary. An army of police kept the peace. The sea of people was in good spirits, and chants of Obama filled the air. The mood for some turned from elation to frustration as the long wait for access to the National Mall stretched on and the crowd started to chant, let us in, let us in. Cops struggled to control the chaos. I will need to see your silver tickets in the air. This man gave up after waiting for three hours to get in. There were people pushing fences over and running over to the USSS Grant statue and people getting hurt and stuff. And this ticket holder was in tears. We, we work for a labor union. And walking. And this is not right. No. Let's move it. April Woodard was in the thick of it. I think this is as close as I'm going to get. I'm supposed to be over there by the field, but right now they've blocked it off so we can't get any further. It took her nearly three hours to make her way five miles through the crowd. Deborah Norville inched along through traffic with Missouri Senator Kit Bond. I have never seen the crowds and the enthusiasm that we've seen here. Next stop, inauguration. Security was tight for everyone. This video is from Deborah's own video camera, shot from her seat near Obama. An incredible view of the sea of humanity Obama saw when he took his historic oath of office. And God bless the United States of America. The whole world stopped to watch Obama's historic swearing in. Here's our Megan Alexander. Massive crowds packed New York's Times Square, cheering with their eyes glued on the giant monitors above. And school came to a halt across the land as students watched history unfolding. Thousands of kids crowded into New York's Harlem Armory for the momentous occasion. And the celebrations not just in Washington, D.C., here in New York at the Harlem Armory, these students said they wanted to see history in the making. This is one day of school they didn't want to miss. Barack H. Obama. The event was carried live at an IMAX theater in Los Angeles. You solemnly swear. In homes throughout the USA, people gathered with family and friends for viewing parties, like this one hosted by Penny Johnson, who played America's first black first lady on Fox's show 24. This is so special. I, I can't, words can't describe it. Beyonce Knowles, the singer from the sizzling group Destiny's Child, hit a real high note this summer. Shazam! You know what you want me to say? It? Oh, God. Shazam! <laughs> She's parlayed a successful singing career into a big screen role in the film Austin Powers in Goldmember. The future better get ready for me because I'm Foxy Cleopatra, and I'm a whole lot of woman. <laughs> it was my first movie. I was around all these legendary people, and I learned so much every day, and I laughed every day, all day. She really was on that screen like she belonged there, and I think people really, really, I think are gonna start writing roles for her because she did uh -huh. have such a big impression in Gold Member. Shut your mouth. Now don't think for a minute that the hit movie role, hot songs, magazine covers, and commercials are part of an overnight success story, not by a long shot. <laughs> Yep, this is Beyonce on Star Search in 1992, performing her heart out. 
This videotape was shot by family members watching from the audience. The group is called Girls Time, which would eventually become Destiny's Child. But like a lot of stars, they didn't win. When I talked to Beyonce about their, their loss on Star Search, she told me they cried backstage. That was um, a crushing loss for them. What a lot of people don't know is that Beyonce, who turned 21 this summer, has been performing since she was about seven years old, growing up in Houston. Her career has been strategically managed by her parents, Matthew and Tina Knowles. You have to believe. I, I absolutely believe that. I mean, my philosophy is if I don't believe it, I can't expect anyone else to believe it. So I absolutely uh, saw and vision the success that we're having today, and I see and vision even greater success. You cannot talk about Beyonce without talking about Destiny's Child. As a matter of fact, Beyonce doesn't really talk about herself without referencing the group. To your left. And what about those constant rumors of an inevitable breakup now that she's on the big screen and planning a solo album? Um, Destiny's Child is not broken up. We still talk every day. We're still going to go on tour and do more performances together. Being in a group is hardly a bad thing when you've sold more than 15 million albums worldwide and won two Grammys. It's very surreal to me. Um, I don't even realize. People say I don't realize, which I don't think I do. How, how much success Destiny's Child and, and I've had and my whole family has had. And it's just such a blessing. But along with the blessings, there's been a curse or two. Two former members of Destiny's Child fired Matthew Knowles as their manager. He then dropped them from the group and the two women promptly sued. Destiny's Child also found itself in the middle of another lawsuit claiming defamation, suggesting that the lyrics from the hit Survivor were directed at the former members. All the lawsuits have been settled. It's actually part of success, lawsuits. And they come out of the woodwork. With the lawsuits behind him, Matthew Knowles is building a real family empire. I'm, I'm proud to be your sister. Y'all give it up. I love it very much. So much. Inside Edition was there exclusively when Beyonce introduced her 16-year-old sister Solange at the New York City Music Showcase. Afterwards, our cameras were in the dressing room, and the sisters couldn't stop talking about each other. I am very, very proud of her. I definitely just look up to her, and so much that I know I wouldn't know if she wasn't my big sister, so I'm just really appreciative of that. Oh, wow. <laughs> Charles Smith Jr. acts like any other nine-year-old kid. He runs. He plays. But Charles isn't like the other kids. He has a God-given talent. Meet the Reverend Charles Smith Jr. Standing just four feet three inches and weighing in at 48 pounds. He may just be the youngest licensed preacher in America. With his three sisters and one brother singing back up, this pint-sized preacher is bringing a big message to the Rosemont Baptist Church in Jackson, Mississippi. Man can see easy ham, but except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The people, people drinking, need to stop drinking, they need to stop smoking, they need to stop. They, they need to stop gambling their money. But how did Charles find his calling at such a young age? Well, according to the Smiths, it all began seven years ago when Charles Sr. came home one day with a new suit for Charles Jr. His parents say that whenever their son put on his new suit, he was filled with a spirit. When people see him at his age, they can more see uh, God than anything because if uh, a little child like that can preach with such power as he does then most people know that it comes from God. As little Charles grew older his desire to preach grew stronger. He decided he would dedicate his life to the faith by becoming a man of the cloth, a very young man of the cloth.
that want to be a preacher. When I get eight years old, he lies, lies to me. Lies. Reverend Jimmy Lee Edwards, pastor of the Rosemont Baptist Church, heard about this pint-sized preacher and decided to meet with the Smith family to discuss Charles's heavenly calling. I talked with little Charles and I asked him, I said, Charles, I said, you sure that you've been calling to the ministry? God have called you into the ministry? He said, yes, I am a minister. Reverend Edwards put his decision to a vote. The members of his church agreed and Charles was ready to begin spreading God's word. This home video shows Charles, or should we say Reverend Smith, delivering his first sermon ever. He knew being a preacher would be a tall order. He just didn't know how tall. We had a little a little, little box that we uh, made for children to stand at the water fountain. And so that particular Sunday, we brought it to the pool pit and he was standing on it. Let's praise the Lord for the Reverend Charles Smith Jr. Yes. at the age of nine. I'd like to help people. I like to preach to them in the pool pit. I just say that God loves me, I love you too. And I got born again, my daddy asked my mama, and my daddy is I born again. But the Rev isn't the only one in the family with talent. His little sisters and brothers know how to sing a tune as well. They call themselves the Stair Step Singers because they're so close in age. I've never uh, seen a young man of this age preach the gospel like he preached the gospel. And I've had numerous phone calls, you know, uh, wanting to get in contact with him, wanted, wanted Charles to come down to their church. When he's not in school, Charles rarely watches TV. He'd rather spend his time with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But despite Charles's heavenly vocation, Underneath it all, he's just an ordinary kid. <laughs> You're a legend, and you haven't stopped. How do you stay current? Hmm. How do you stay, keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening? And I'll tell you this, you know fashion, you know music, you know what's going on. How do you, how do you stay involved? I hope that I do have my finger on that. I'm not sure. I hope so. Um, I think you do. I mean, you know, is it, are you reading magazines? What, what, how, how, does, how does Aretha stay um, current and, and keep us excited? Growth. It's the growth element. That's, that's what it is. Uh, I certainly don't want to be dated by any means. And it's the growth, a constant and evolving growth. So when I got the assignment to interview her, I was both excited and nervous. I was excited because it's the great Aretha Franklin. I was nervous because it was the great Aretha Franklin, but it was incredible. It's one of the greatest interviews I've ever done in my career. She has a very down home way about her. And I was telling her that my father's from the South and a bit about my mother and how I grew up in Detroit. And she really appreciated it and connected to that. I think she felt that there was a similarity, though she's much older, a similarity in uh, our values. It was a really, really hot day when I interviewed her. And I had heard uh, stories of how she doesn't like to perform in air conditioning, that she likes the room to be basically hot. And the second I walked into the hotel suite, it was burning up. And, but she looked cool as a cucumber. She was totally relaxed. The most exciting thing musically to me right now is my new album that's coming out uh, in January. It's going to be produced by Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, and a few cuts I'm going to produce myself. Burt Bacharach has some things in it, and uh, other writers from Detroit have one or two things in there. But the music, it's just the music that I love so much. And it sounds like, from what you're telling me, listening to people, that it's a real melting pot. It's a cool Yes, mix. it is. You've got a buffet and a plethora of good music.
What I really found generous and kind of Aretha is how she complimented Kelly Clarkson, a contestant on American Idol. Aretha thought that she was great. She loved her voice, she loved her performance style, and she basically predicted that she would be a star. Kelly, I think, um, certainly has the potential to be a very enduring uh, and established artist and a favorite. She had a combination of things. Uh, she has a very likable personality, and I like that. And uh, of course, she's a very good singer. And uh, the song selection was great. And she just kind of impressed me as someone that Broadway might be calling uh, and or a pop recording artist. That was the way uh, she impressed me, really. If Aretha Franklin, who has seen them all, says that you're a great singer and you're bound for greatness, you can basically take it to the bank. Aretha thought Justin Guarini was really charming. She thought he had that special something that makes the young girls swoon. Justin is uh, a crowd pleaser. Um, if I were the age of the little girls, I might have been squealing and screaming myself. But I just thought he was really cute. He had a lot of class and uh, would love for him to open for me sometime. And, um, Does he know that? I don't think so. When Aretha Franklin died, I was uh, heartbroken on two accounts that she is one of the greatest singers ever. So that was sad. But also, Aretha Franklin is Detroit. Her soul is in Detroit. And she's a homegrown girl. And so the city uh, really was devastated by her passing. Aretha Franklin had the opportunity in her career to live anywhere in the world. But she chose to always maintain Detroit as her home. It's because she loved the city. She loved everything about the city. Her father had a church in Detroit. She started singing in the church in Detroit. Her family was in Detroit. She lived there her entire career. And so the love that she gave Detroit, she got back in death. It is exactly why the lines were down the block because people felt like Aretha Franklin was one of them. She was grand, she was glorious, she was bigger than life, but in truth, she was a Detroit girl. Lastly, are you still having fun? Absolutely, if I weren't, I would be sitting at home, cooking, watching the soap operas, and that would be it. Yes, absolutely, I'm having a wonderful time. What a career. So you can imagine how excited I am. I'm about to meet the Godfather of Soul. I think I spoke to three or four of his press people, and each one of them told me the exact same thing. They said, you must refer to him as Mr. Brown. Do not call him James. And uh, so, of course, you know, they put the fear of the Lord in you, and, and that's all you're thinking about. That's all you're thinking about is you're about to go meet the Godfather of Soul. Do not call him James Brown. So I'm thinking as I walk, walk in the room, I've got to call him Mr. Brown. So I walk in, I introduce myself, and I say something like, hello, Mr. Brown. He says, call me James. <laughs> but before the show even starts, we're actually going to go backstage into the dressing room to talk to the godfather of soul himself. Hello. How are you? It is a pleasure to meet you. How are you? Fine, thank you. Unless Trent from Inside Edition. And the one thing I remember most about him was just, he was so warm and inviting. He, it was almost as though he, uh, he felt like he was a mentor to this, in his eyes, young black reporter. Because <laughs> he, sort of, he sort of spoke to me in that, in that sort of tone where he was just like a fatherly figure giving advice. People say that you look incredibly young, especially out there. I mean, obviously this keeps you young. I thank God and her keep me young. <laughs> we got a beautiful little son, so I think the mixture is great, and thank God for that. But thank you for the compliment. You ever get tired of it? Well, I, I, I get tired if the business don't go correct, you know. Uh, 
only somebody I really go through it with is me, and Mr. Bobby, when I'm a manager. Um, and uh, we want to do things, and um, you know, we want to do things 25 years ago that just happened today. I mean, you know, people don't move fast, you know, not when it's positive. Right. They move fast when it's negative, you know. But uh, we want to do what we can to keep things straight. And I watch Inside Edition a lot too, my wife. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, we watch it a lot. It's great, great, and very informative and very educational and entertaining too. And we love you over there. Do you think you'll do you think you'll ever retire? Yeah, I'll retire when the God put the last breath put, put the last breath out of me. Now I may not be jumping across the stage because your legs go because I'm an athlete and uh, your legs leave. But uh, I won't ever quit because we got projects that uh, we got some projects that kind of, it's like a over the gin mill turning out the different things. We want to turn out complete artists, you know. Like I took my wife. Your wife I, is an artist now. That's right. And and the thing about this, and she answers the name of Tommy Ray. Um, talented people that don't get a complete shot at it, you know, and and they need that. The Apollo Theater is always the Apollo Theater with me, and it's very important to people uh, because it's a mecca of opportunity for people that don't think they can make it. Now I didn't make it through the Apollo, but we need that concept. We had that same thing in Augusta, Georgia, called the Lenox Theater, and that's where I made it, being shown to the people. So we've got to give our, sh our kids a break. You wonder why. The, you, you, you find a lot of crime and and uh, uh, criminal uh, things happening to different people in different areas uh, because they don't have anything to do. Uh, they don't have anything on their mind. Young people don't have anything on their mind. What you what they can have on their mind? You know, you watch the war, you watch all this other stuff. We've got to push entertainment, more sports, and uh, more family discipline. Well, I mean, it's it's an incredible feeling when you think that you you've spoken to this icon and then. Six months later, you know, you're you're covering stories about his funeral. Um, it was um, sometimes in this job, you just you just pinch yourself. You say, "Wow, I, I I can't believe that I that I met this person. I can't believe I was sitting right across from them and in how how warm and engaging they were." And um, it's just it, it's um you know it's a bittersweet feeling you, you, to to meet somebody who is such an icon and then to lose them so soon afterwards. He really was. He was an icon. He was um, he was a civil rights leader. He had a message in his music that was empowering for African Americans back in the 60s and 70s, and it was it was just incredible. You know what, guys? Have a great show tonight. It is a pleasure to meet you, sir. Well, I hope you live 200 years, and I live 200 years minus one day. Yeah. <laughs> so I never know beautiful people like you on an Inside Edition that passed away. I got a call from the lobby and. Uh, the rhetoric went, hey, uh, the, I'm Cassius Marcellus Clay. I'm the Golden Glove champion of Louisville. I won the Golden Gloves in the Pan American Games. I won the Golden Gloves in Chicago. I want to talk to you. That man was a boxer named Cassius Marcellus Clay from Louisville, Kentucky. And by 1958, when he met the man who was to help him become the greatest, Clay was already learning to be an incredible self-promoter. There was a talk that was to change sports forever and take boxing out of the year of the dingy, smoke-filled arenas into the world of multi-million dollar entertainment. But first, Cassius Clay had one final amateur title to win, the gold medal at the 1960 Olympics. Angelo Dundee quickly realized he had a future world heavyweight champion on his hands. I could see his enthusiasm, his desire, wanting to know every little thing. And in 1964, against Sonny Liston, Ali took his best shot at the world title. Psychologically, he had Liston Drain. He thought my guy was nuts. He was wondering when the guy with the white coats were going to come and get my guy. That See motor that? mouth psychology was to become his trademark and make the new world champion a press agent's dream. But boxing publicist Patty Dreyfus says the real play was very different. He was very soft-spoken, very quiet, very sweet, very gentle, not at all like the public image. Clay had become a Muslim and changed his name to Muhammad Ali. Then the man who feared no one in the ring shocked the world when he refused to be drafted to fight for the U.S. Army. I hoped that I was as good a Catholic as Muhammad was a Muslim. Stripped of his title after being convicted for refusing to be drafted, Ali finally made his comeback against new world champion Joe Frazier in 1971, just months before the Supreme Court overturned Ali's conviction. I want him like hog won't slop. 
<laughs> in the ring, Frazier and Ali made boxing magic, and they proved it with the rematch they called the Thriller in Manila. And I wrote a short poem. It says it will be a killer and a thriller and a killer when I get the gorilla in Manila. Ali was the winner. On Sunday, April 14th in Philadelphia, there is to be a tribute to both Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the fight of the century. Ali was to lose and regain his title, but by 1979, two decades of boxing had taken their toll, and he retired a champion. But he didn't retire from the world spotlight. Although he's since been diagnosed as suffering from Parkinson's syndrome, he met Iraq's Saddam Hussein just weeks before war broke out, returning to America with a group of hostages he persuaded the dictator to release. So many people came up to him for handouts, and he was so willing to help anybody and everybody. He would never say no. These days, Muhammad Ali may no longer be able to float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. But Angelo Dundee insists that no one should feel sorry for the man they still call the greatest. Nobody has to have any swan songs for Muhammad Ali. Muhammad's a happy individual. Michael Jordan is a master of the game. He led the Chicago Bulls to their first ever championship and was named the NBA's most valuable player. His miraculous ability to put the ball in the basket, however he shoots it, is awesome, even to him. It just happens. It just instinctively it happens. And, and I amaze myself as much as I try to, or as much as I amaze everyone else. Jordan makes almost $11 million a year, only about a third of which comes from playing basketball. Where he really cashes in is with commercial endorsements. Ah, better get your whole grain. I bet eat my Wheaties. In a time when sports figures keep finding themselves in the midst of scandal, here's one athlete who's the darling of Madison Avenue. They portrayed him as a child's best friend. Like Mike, if I could be like Mike. Education's biggest supporter. Don't be stupid. Stay in school. And a parent's bundle of joy. Think mom would like me and these? Maybe. And as if there's not enough of Michael Jordan to go around, he's even been turned into a cartoon superhero. Michael Jordan seems almost too good to be true, and he knows it. That's probably one of the, the disadvantages you know, of being a role model for so many, is that you know, every move you make has got to be the right move. And if it's the wrong move, then it can be misinterpreted in the wrong manner. I went to Chicago to see him, curious to know, does Michael Jordan the man live up to Michael Jordan the role model? Everything I found out about him says yes. This is, after all, someone who, after going pro, spent summers to finish his college degree. I was very fortunate that uh, my parents really taught me what was right and what was wrong. His mom and dad still follow him to games, just as they did while he was growing up in North Carolina. He's a very private man who keeps his wife and two small boys out of the limelight. To Michael, basketball isn't everything. You have a lot of, do a lot of charity work. You know, I, I started receiving criticism for not giving back enough. And I guess maybe that's due to, because I don't publicize a lot of things that I try to do in, in terms of giving back to the community. I, it's just something that I, I don't seek publicity for. The Michael Jordan Foundation, run by his mother, has made a big impact on the many children's charities it supports. When you focus and achieve, always try to pick up the underdog and help them, help them to believe. Michael believes so strongly in the power of education, he's even endowed his old high school, Laney, in Wilmington, North Carolina, with an annual college scholarship. After all, it's where he got his first jump on the competition. I bet you never thought you were going to see me on the other end of this bar. But actually, a lot of us grew up playing basketball when we were kids. I played for nine years competitively in my home state of Georgia. The sad thing is, not all of us could go on to become basketball stars. And in high school, it's tough to tell who's going to make it and who's not. Do you know who Miro Smith is? No. He's the last guy to make my high school basketball team. One of Michael's favorite stories is about Leroy Smith and how he, not Michael, made the varsity team their sophomore year in high school. At the time, Leroy was six foot seven, and Michael, even though he was as competitive as he is today, stood only five foot nine. And he was just hurt, and I said, "You don't give up. You go back in there and you try again." You don't give up, you know, you give it your all. It helped me deal with a lot of things, and, and I matured at that time, and I've just continued to look back on those situations and, and, and prosper in life today. Michael Jordan won a gold medal in the 1984 Olympics, 
and is committed to playing the Summer Games next year in Barcelona. But he still has an Olympic dream for his close friend, Magic Johnson. I know he still dreams of playing in the Olympics. Yeah, I think that's the only dream that has eluded him in his whole career, which, you know, his career has been unbelievable. But I think that's something that he would have come out of retirement to do. I just want to say that uh, I'm going to miss playing. And uh, I will now become a, a spokesman for the HIV virus. He's very you know, strong individually. And, uh, he was a lot stronger than I was when he actually told me. And uh, that really helped me overcome what he was actually telling me. The day I talked with Michael, this book began making the rounds. It's a gossipy chronicle of a year in the life of the Chicago Bulls, accusing him of not being a team player and demanding special treatment. The book is, is basically is, is something, uh, it's for profit, but this is one of the negative things that I say that you have to look at it in a positive sense. You know, you just continue on down the road as you have and you know, it's not going to affect me. I just hope it doesn't affect us as a team and I don't think it will. Good or bad, you know, just accept life as it comes you know, and, and try to enjoy it as much as possible.